Good morning, Bethany Church. We're so glad that you are here with us this morning as we come together to worship and to sit under the word. Um, we're going to start, as we always do, with the call to worship. Uh, this one comes from Psalm 100. just highlights uh, our call to praise and glorify our good, loving, and powerful God. Will you stand with me as we do this? Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give, him, give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. When found in the desert place, the walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. With every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the Blessed be your name, for the sun shining down on me, for the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, the road marked with suffering, for the pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed 
righteousness, oh God, how I need you. The sea runs deep, your grace is more, your grace is found, is where you are, where you are. single mind have one heart desire to know the one my soul and heart adore have one single aim to bring you holy praise shower all my love here at your feet Jesus you are all on me. Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight, I found in you. To know the one my soul and heart adore. I have a single aim to bring you holy praise. Shower all my love here at your feet. Jesus, you are all I want or need. Jesus, you are all I long. Jesus, you are all I want on you. 
Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight, found in you. Jesus, you are all I want on me. Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight, found in you. Jesus, you are all I want to be. Jesus, you are all I long to please. My portion and my prize, my joy and my delight, found in you. Jesus, you are all I want to be. Jesus, you are all Good morning, everybody. We have the privilege now to take a few moments in our service to pause and pray. And as we do that, um, our growth groups right now are going to be starting this week going through a book called Praying the Bible. We'll talk about that a little more in a minute. But we've been trying to practice as a church a bit more, um, looking at our prayer life. Sometimes we can be uh, pray the, about the same old things and say the same old things about the same old things. Uh, and praying the scriptures helps us to... Um, Mix up our prayer life a little bit. Pray with a little variety as we follow Scripture uh, as our guide. And so today I'm going to look at Psalm 96. So if you've got a Bible and you want to open it, there's one under the chair in front of you too. I'm going to read a verse or two and then just pray spontaneously in light of those verses this morning. Uh, and um, bless the Lord with our prayer and continue to prepare our hearts to worship uh, as we ask the Holy Spirit just to open our hearts to the Word today and to each other to each other as well. So, let's bow. Psalmist writes in verse 1 and 2, O sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Heavenly Father, we sing to you because of all you have done that you have made us in the earth, you have called us good, and yet we know through sin we have been lost. But we sing a song this morning because of the uh, salvation we find in Jesus Christ, that there is reason to sing in the earth, even in the midst this morning of trials and pain and suffering. Because of the resurrection, we have hope to sing songs even of lament, Songs of of pain that turn to trust. Songs of victory as you've triumphed over sin and death. And songs that point us to the future because you're coming back someday. Let salvation be on our lips day to day. Not just Sunday morning when we gather to worship, but as we talk even today about stewardship. Stewardship is every day. Stewarding things in our life is every moment and every place of our life. So let salvation work its way into every part of our life and every day. Verse 3 and 4, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of all nations. You are the Lord of the earth. And yet there are people groups around this world who still don't have access to your name, still don't have access to the name of Jesus and the message of the gospel. And so, Jesus, would you do that work through your spirit as the Spirit, that is your role, to take the message of Christ to the hearts and minds of people all over the world. And so any part we have in that, Lord, whether it's supporting our missionaries who we ask your blessing upon this morning or sharing with our neighbors, may we be part of seeing your glory declared among the nations in all your great works because you are to be praised. And above that even or or connected to that is the fact that you call us to fear you not in a um, kind of servile fear of cowering in terror, but even those who know you fear you with an awe and a reverence and respect that yes, you are so intimate and personal in Jesus Christ and yet you are totally otherworldly. Let us not forget that. That fear has an appropriate place in the heart and minds of children of God 
And actually, it's connected greatly to our stewardship today. If we don't think of you and if we don't fear you in a holy, good way, we won't steward our things in light of you. Verse 10 says, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never, uh, it shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Lord, as we look at the situation of the world this weekend, and I think of this verse, sometimes it's hard for us to see you reigning when there is so much chaos and turmoil in the world, and yet we trust that, that you will judge the nations with equity, you will show your justice on the earth. I think this morning of just the new conflict in the Middle East with Israel and Iran, ongoing wars and other places that have been taking place too, but Lord... We pray specifically for that area of the world, the Middle East, Lord, and just the people there, people made in your image of all those different countries in that area, people who you love, people who you desire to come to know you. And so we pray for that area this morning. We pray for, as so many have for so many decades and millennia, for peace, for cooler heads to prevail, for, for love to come forward in a way that maybe it hasn't before. And we know Christ that is only a work that you can do. And so we pray for the church there. We pray for individual hearts and minds to be transformed. And we pray for wisdom and, and forgiveness. We trust you that you'll come. So come, Lord Jesus. Do your work in the world. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, I'm glad you're here today. I would rather not want you to be anywhere else right now during this moment, but here. And I know there's a lot of places you could be this morning. So I'm glad that you're stewarding your heart and soul well this morning, as we're going to talk about that in our message. You're stewarding it. You're being with his people and opening yourself up to his truth and other people. So glad you're here. So welcome. This is your official welcome. I am Jeff Jennings. I serve as the pastor here at Bethany Church, one of the pastors. And if you're online watching, hello. I know some of you are homesick and some of you are just unable to make it today. Uh, I'm glad you're checking in that way with us online. If you're new to Bethany Church, I already met one uh, person this morning. want to let you know, we're just glad you're here. Our hospitality team welcomed you in probably, and they're going to be out there afterwards at that welcome counter to give you a gift if you're new. It's a Bethany Church water tumbler kind of thingy here uh, with our logo on it. Inside it, there's some uh, notes about the church, a letter from me, so I think a sticker about from our church, just some stuff to let, uh, welcome you in and give you some information about the church. If you're here, maybe you've been a few weeks or a few months, and you're kind of like, I, I, we're ready to make Bethany Church our home and, and be here and call it our church. Uh, we ask also if you fill out a next step card. This is what get your email and some personal info about you. Um, just so we know you're here, we can get you in our system and in our, in our um, uh, directory and on our all church email. So uh, you can start just staying up to date on everything going on here at the church. Uh, so you can fill that out and bring it to the hospitality of the welcome counter or put it in the box, our offering boxes. Uh, on the back. Uh, I, did, I was looking for somebody this morning. Are the Hayes here? Jim and Tammy, to see them? I don't see them this morning. Well we'll, well, we'll chat with them. There they are. There's Tammy right there. Hi, Tammy. Come on up. Tammy's going to chat with us a little bit this morning. As we come to a new, fresh season of growth group, hi, come on over here. Um, as we come to a new, fresh season of growth group, we're, we're, we are challenging and encouraging people to see part of stewarding their um, heart and soul, as we're going to talk about this morning, is more than Sunday morning. It's being part of a small group, whether that's a DNA group, which we'll highlight in the coming weeks, actually, or a growth group. Our growth groups are starting up again this week, and we're going to, as I said, be going through this book, Praying the Bible by Donald Whitney, um, and we're going to be practicing that. I know that makes you maybe some of you a little timid, but we're going to be doing kind of what I just did this morning. There's a script kind of to use, and we're not just going to be praying out loud right away. We're going to ask you just to kind of do that quietly in your groups, but short little book, but we're not going to talk about that necessarily this morning, but I want to hear from you kind of, you guys have been in a growth group the last few years, and it's on, you're all good. Okay. Maybe you could tell us um, kind of how growth groups have impacted you, and I, I think James goes with you. I think Christopher's gone too at times, so tell us a little bit how it's impacted your family. Well, ev they both go with us. I mean, everybody's there, but um, I did want to say as soon as he started praying, I started coughing. I think it was because I was getting nervous, and my boys aren't here with me today. <laughs> but anywho, um, I wanted to say, Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, 
For where two or three are gathered mm. together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And we feel the presence of God. We look forward to our group every week. And it's a place where we can talk and discuss anything with our growth group family. Yeah, and normally we do sermon discussion groups uh, for our growth groups. And we'll, we'll keep doing that even after this, this book. Um, but yeah, I like that idea. I love that you pointed out that verse. Because I'm even going to say in our sermon this morning that there really is no model in the Bible for growing in Christ alone. It's really not a thing in the Bible. A disciple, by definition, is part of a group of people following Jesus. You really can't do it alone. Um, so I love to hear you say that verse of the two or three gather, because something d- unique does happen when we gather, doesn't it, as you've experienced? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I know Christopher's gone too, and James is there with you, and, and um, who's, you guys are in Bruce's group? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bru- where's Bruce? Hey, Bruce, growth group leader back there. I'm so grateful for our growth group leaders. Um, thanks for leading that, Bruce. So, um, you know, I think we're, I was going to talk to you a little bit about kind of the, maybe if somebody's considering joining this morning and not quite sure about it. Um, well, we were talking about this last night, and... <clears throat> I mean, don't hesitate. It's a great place to discuss, learn, and reflect on God's word and grow. Okay. And um, I know that many of you have done that over the years, and maybe you've been in them and stepped out. Uh, I want to encourage you today to consider that. We have a clipboard out there, and you can put your name on it, and I will contact you or somebody from the office this week. It's not too late to get in, even this week, with this prayer book, um, Praying the Bible. If you're in a group and you didn't know we're doing that, we're doing that for four weeks. They're free. They're out there today. How many of you grabbed them already? Raise your hand. All right. Well, good. A lot of you. There's some. There, there's a bunch still out there, so grab them today. And uh, see, so if you want to talk about group, go see Tammy out there today. Ask her more about our group or, or Bruce back there. Uh, but thanks, Tammy, for coming up today. Thank Sharon. you. Give a round of applause. You know, you know, I could stand up here week after week and encourage you in different ways, but it, there's value and I think power in hearing from each other and other gospel stories in the church life as we grow uh, together. Well, I got a f- couple more things to announce uh, in your worship folder or behind me. Tonight is worship night. It's our quarterly time. Woo, I heard a woo somewhere. It's our, it's our quarterly time. Once a quarter, we get together at 7 p.m. to 8 for one hour to sing songs together. Um, I know some of you don't like to drive at night, but guess what? It's light like until 8 now, so we don't even have that excuse anymore. Um, come back tonight to be here at 7 o'clock. We're going to sing. We might have some time of prayer. I'm really looking forward to that just to get our voices. We, the psalm started the, this morning, sing to the Lord a new song, all the earth. And we get to do that tonight when we gather. So come back at 7 o'clock tonight. The Youth Service Project is happening. David, Pastor David is doing something new with our youth to try and kind of broaden our horizon outside of our kind of can-be bubble, which I know we love that bubble, but there's more people outside of our bubble than just here in our bubble. So uh, David is going to be taking the youth group on a service project with an organization called Doing Good Things in Portland. They're going to be going May 3rd and 4th with a chaperoned group, a group that is very experienced and been doing this for about 20 years to take some of our high school students to serve a community meal, hand out some, what do you call the kits? hygiene kits and different things like that, uh, and stay over one night at, I think, a local church there they're going to be staying at. Uh, I I think I'm going as well, actually, with our youth. So I really want to encourage your youth, um, challenge them to consider this. Uh, There's a little QR code there. Cost is $100. It's May 3rd and 4th, just one night. You can sign up for the QR code or in the Church Center app in the um, church calendar there. Women's Day Retreat is coming up, I think, next, sa- next Saturday, yeah. Next Saturday, the 20th, a woohoo for Women's Retreat, or two, so I, that's great. Women's Day Retreat uh, on April 20th, 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. I think there's, a, there's actually a bunch of women already signed up, um, so we're really thrilled with the, the, re- the response so far, so thank you, ladies. But keep doing it. Keep inviting a friend. Keep uh, considering who could come as we talk about um, the armor of God from Ephesians 6. Uh, you can sign up on the QR code there, or there'll be somebody, I think, at the counter, the welcome counter, uh, in the gathering place, or the calendar as well, $25. And if you can't, if, you, if, that's, if, if cost is keeping you away, still sign up. We want you to go, and we'll, we'll work it out. And then finally this morning, a couple of new resources out there for you. We got two this, this month for April, one for kids and one for adults. The first one for kids is called The Priest with Dirty Clothes by R.C. Sproul, a wonderful book that I've read to my kids over the years uh, that really talks about the idea of justification. What does it mean that we are justified in Christ? And the great switch that happens, dirty clothes, the priest with dirty clothes, we give Christ our sin 
He puts on us like clothes, like his righteousness. Great book for kids to help them understand what it means to be justified in Christ. And the second one for adults is called Bright Hope for Tomorrow. This is a book, uh, the subtitle says, How Anticipating Jesus' Return Gives Us Strength for Today. You've heard that phrase that he was so heavenly minded he was of no earthly good. That's not biblical, actually. In fact, to be so heavenly minded should actually make us some of the people that do the most earthly good and actually find the most encouragement when we think about Christ's second coming. This is a book that is not going to look at like kind of the endless churning out of kind of um, speculation on second coming that happens in a lot of places. This is a book that's going to take you right to the heart of what does it mean for our life when Christ returns and why is there hope in his return? I want to encourage you to check that out if you're out there today. Both are $10, which is a discount price, and they are out there today. I think that is all from me, and we're going to have the kids come on this way towards the front. Come on this way. Uh, Today, just give me a high five on the way out. You can head down the middle. Go, and go, and go. Have a great time in Sunday school. As Pam comes up to get the scripture ready, you can turn to Luke 16. They're getting better. As we go, wait, wait, shh, shh, shh. high five. He's like, what do you want to do with me? <laughs> Bye. Bye. I can imagine you whistling for me. Okay, I, I'm up here. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, if you'd like to turn to Luke 16, we're going to read uh, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 18. Yeah, and if you don't have a Bible, there should be one um, under the seat in front of you. And um, if not, just look down a few because they're, they're sporadically spread out. And if, and if you don't have a Bible at home, feel free to take them also. All right, so the parable of the dishonest manager. Um, he also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, What shall I do, since my master is taking the management away from me? I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and set down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, Make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to the true riches? And if you had not been faithful in that which is another's, Who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. This is the word of the Lord. 
Thanks, Pam. I'm so appreciative of our scripture readers who each week take the time to read the passage beforehand and, and get ready and try to read it in a way that's engaging. I'm really grateful for them. So thanks, Pam, for reading a um, confusing passage, to say the least, this morning to us. Some of you are thinking, what are we going to do with this one today? Well, we're entering into the home stretch of the Gospel of Luke, and as we do, we're going to take a little quicker approach to wrap up the Gospel of Luke. My goal is to finish Luke uh, by our summer picnic, July 7th, where we'll be talking about the resurrection, Luke 24, on Baptism Sunday. That's fitting, right? So I'm going to try to time it that way. Um, but that means as we finish, we are, we're going to do a little different. We're going to talk probably a, a chapter a week. We're going to do a little higher flyover to finish up the Gospel of Luke. Uh, we're not going to be uh, skipping necessarily things or not talking about the hard things. We know, uh, you know, we don't uh, skip the hard things here. If the Scripture teaches it, we talk about it. Uh, even like today, talking about divorce and remarriage for a little bit. Um, but I want to encourage you. What that means is each week I'm going to encourage you, uh, if we're going to take maybe a chapter in a week, I want to encourage you to read that chapter ahead of time. We probably won't be reading entire chapters, especially the one that's like 70-some verses. Um, we're not going to probably be reading that in, 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 uh, in the service to finish up. So make sure you read each week, and it's printed in your worship folder, bottom the uh, now, uh, outline for what's next week. So my goal really is I want to start a fresh new series in the fall rather than co coming back for five weeks or four weeks on Luke. I want to start something fresh in the fall. So this morning, let me pray for us for a moment because we are coming to one of the most confusing sections in all of Luke's gospel. Let's pray. Lord, bless our time. Um, we look at Christ's words and some of them from uh, different culture and different time and translated into our language. Some of them are confusing and hard passages. And so would you just give us the uh, wisdom and the insight and the clarity of your spirit's heart to uh, learn from this passage today and be changed by it today. In Christ's name, amen. So as I said, this is one of Luke's really most confusing passages, and many commentators, as they come to it, kind of give up on it. And they're not sure what to do and make of Jesus's words. Even as we were reading it, some of you probably thought, is Jesus commending this manager's dishonesty as he goes and lowers the debts behind his master's back? Is that what Jesus is doing? Is he commending sin or dishonest behavior? So what I'm going to attempt to do today in this large section is attempt to simplify this section as much as I can under the topic of stewardship. This theme of stewardship runs through the entirety of these verses, even to that last verse uh, on marriage. Jesus is calling in these passages us to look at how we handle, how we, um, how we manage, how we steward all the stuff of life, all of it. And so upon hearing now the last couple weeks, the way Jesus, remember those parables, accepts sinners in who repent with a joyous feast, he now comes to his disciples and the Pharisees who are here and us today and asks, are you willing to bring all of your life, all of it, not only the spiritual, but what you do with the physical stuff in your life, the physical realm, uh, money he mentions, the stuff and things. Are you willing to live in a wise, shrewd way for me, Jesus asks. And it's fitting upon hearing the great welcome we have, the feast of the prodigal sons, the lost coin, and all those good things. Now Jesus says, are you willing? Okay, I've accepted you. Are you willing now to live for me? One of the challenges with this passage in our era is that we put such a sharp dis divide in our life between the spiritual world and the material physical world. Humans haven't always done that throughout history. It's really only in the last couple hundred years that we've had this really sharp divide between the physical and the spiritual, or, or this, we might call it the, the secular and the sacred. That really wasn't always there. There wasn't always such a sharp divide. But for us, it kind of is. We think in as our faith in our spiritual terms and spiritual realm, and it doesn't always seep into our everyday physical life and the stuff we have and own. And yet, um, Jesus is calling us to look at that. Easiest way to see this for us is that we kind of designate, a lot of us, our spiritual activity, we kind of um, can, um, you know, put a fence around it or categorize it in Sunday morning. Like, we go to where? 
church. We go to church. And right, it's a building, it's a place. We are, the, we, we are Bethany Church. But really, we're the church, the people. It's us. And so where we go, we take our spiritual life out into the physical world. And so some of us cordon it off to Sunday mornings and, 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 and talk about that being our spiritual life. Maybe the rest of your week, maybe for you, you, you kind of don't really think again much about that. That's the real life's out there, the stuff of work and, and family and sports and finances and relationships. And yet Jesus is saying, no, I want you to steward it all for me. That's the Pharisee's problem in this passage, who Jesus says, he calls them right there, he says, you're lovers of money. There are things, they've got a watertight divide between their stuff and their spiritual life. And so what do they do with Jesus in this passage, to Jesus? They laugh at him. They ridicule him. They say, they're laughing. I'm like, you're ridiculous, Jesus. This is ridiculous. Because they've got this divide. And Jesus is saying, no, get rid of the divide. Bring your spiritual life into every area of your life. So this morning, he's speaking to his disciples. He's asking us to think through these questions. How are we to steward the life God has given us? If God is the creator and sustainer and ruler of all, aren't we living under his roof? Uh, the master. So like the master manager parable, God in the story is the master, the manager is a parallel to us. So let's think in those terms. You remember hearing this phrase growing up? If you're living under our roof, you'll abide by our rules, right? <laughs> you heard that growing up. Well, here though, it, 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 a similar concept, but it's a loving, tender God looking at us saying, okay, I love you. I've saved you. In fact, I, I, we were throwing a feast, right? Remember the prodigal parable? We'll throw a feast for you, and it's awaiting you. So in the meantime, be wise. And the best for you is to let the spiritual and physical come together and actually use the physical stuff in your life to further your spiritual life. You, you live under God's roof. That's the gist. Like verse 16, be those that force their way into the kingdom, which probably is more of a strenuous urging to enter God's kingdom for all of us, to be mindful of how you steward. So we're going to look this Sunday at multiple areas of our life and the responsibility to be good stewards and then the one ultimate steward. So hopefully you got an outline. Hopefully you like to fill things in to keep track of where we're going and scriptures open to Luke 16. We'll, we'll reference a few verses and go back to them. I better turn there too, right? I'm preaching it. Uh, okay, so first area. We are called to steward our things, our stuff well. The story itself of the shrewd manager now, uh, the master and manager, the manager works for the master. The story itself of the dishonest manager is, is fairly understandable. To summarize it, he's dishonest, he's wasting the master's money, he's not a good steward, he's like the prodigal son from the previous parable, spending it all, wasting it, and the master finds out, the master who represents God, and he's going to fire him. So the manager uh, doesn't want to beg, too lazy to work hard, he cuts some deals with all the debtors to his master, he hooks them up, that's what he does, he hooks them up, so that when he loses his job... He'll have friends who will hire him and repay the favor. Pretty other similar, simple story. The challenge comes in Jesus' words. Everybody's like, what is Jesus talking about? What is he, what is he saying? It comes in Jesus' application in verses 8 and 9. Look at 8 and 9 with me of 16. Uh, Jesus says, well, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. Then Jesus kind of steps out of the parable and speaks to the disciples. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Any idea what that means? I see some shaking hands like, uh, I don't know what he's talking about there. <laughs> what is he talking about? So the master here commends the manager's shrewdness on one hand, while not condoning his dishonesty. Uh, but he's com he is con uh, commending him at least on one part of his character, the shrewdness in some way to take care of himself. And then Jesus steps out of the parable in 8b there and says, the sons of this world, he says, they use wisdom as they deal with their stuff. And he says, you too should as sons of light use the things, the stuff of this world, in particular your money, for spiritual gain, spiritual advantage. 
The punchline's in verse 9 where he says, unrighteous wealth, use unrighteous wealth. And really what most commentators think that means is just worldly wealth. Wealth you earn by working and, and living on this planet and having a job. He says, use the wealth of this world to make friends that will outlast when all that wealth disappears. Because it will. And it's going to. Make friends that will receive you into eternity. Well, who are those kind of friends? Who would that be? Well, it's either one or two things. It's either other Christians who will precede you to heaven and receive you when you arrive, as we talked about uh, at Doris's service yesterday. Uh, those that might be there to wait and, and, and welcome her in. So it's either that or, or only the true, really, truly friends who can receive you this way. Father, Son, and Spirit. It's one of those two. But regardless, Jesus is saying this here. If you place your security in money, it will fail you. So use your money to prepare yourself for the future that's coming. Act shrewdly now with your money to secure your own best interests on the future day in heaven. This means we steward our money with generosity. Because ultimately, it's the master's anyway. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? It's all his. So he says, use it with generosity. It's actually the Lord's anyway and not really ours. We are stewards. It's a really important word. And it's a really important concept in all of God's word and for our life every day. This idea of stewardship. What is that? It's really um, hard to kind of really think about stewards. A lot of us don't own a lot of property and, or have big farms where we steward and manage. And a lot of us work for someone and don't have people under us, right? The best way I've thought how to illustrate it in my own life is the day we took our first child home from the hospital. <laughs> Some of you may have had a day like that, remember? And I, I remember the feeling you know, for nine months, this baby, you know, the baby had already been living in our, inside our house, just inside mommy, right, as every baby does. But the birth happens, right? And you're there uh, maybe for a night, and then, you know, then it comes a time, it's time to go home. And so usually the husband gets the car seat all ready, and you kind of figure out the latch system, you know, and how annoying that is. You try to get it all in the car, and you, you get ready, and, you know, the, the, you get the outfit. There's, an, there's a go-home outfit. Did you know that? There's a go home, oh, oh yeah, I heard that out there. There's a go home outfit, right? And, and then you, 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 you get to the moment and it's time to go. And the dad's like, the little human's gonna go home with us? <laughs> like, I remember thinking to the nurse going, you're coming too, right? <laughs> you're coming with us, right? And she's like, no, Mr. Jennings, she's like, you know, this is now your child. You need to go, get out of here, you know, take the baby, go home, and now you're going to raise it. And you're like, yeah, uh, we are? <laughs> and this, then the stewardship begins, right? Care for, feed, change, protect, provide, teach, love, steward something, or in this case, a person, someone. The child is ultimately God's. We are stewards, but so is it with everything in your life. Everything. It's to be stewarded so that the master of the house is pleased. Back to the parable. So that he's pleased. Our stewardship to money is to use it in, 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 in loving, generous ways. Why is that? Because money can be really powerful. We know that. And actually seductive. And every one of us in this room at some time or another has, has been tempted to give our whole selves in service to it or the acquiring of it. You've heard investors say, you don't work for your money, but put your money to work for you, right? And Jesus is saying here, in some sense, yes, but put it to work for you in light of the kingdom work that's going on in the world. Or better yet, Jesus is saying, use your money in such a way that you show the world that I am your true love. Not your money, not your things, not your stuff. Money gives us a false sense of security at times, doesn't it? 
a false sense of security, safety, and, and a happiness that as, because we live with such this divide between the physical and the spiritual, sometimes the physical seems more real to us, actually. It's tangible. I can hold it, right? I can see it. I can look at my numbers in my account or on my phone. It seems more real at times than God's provision or the kingdom work, the spiritual. But just like our children, all our things, and in particular, Jesus hits hard on this, and he talks a lot about money in the, in the Gospels, a lot. He says, in particular, all our money is from God, and yet money is a co- big competitor with God for our hearts and lives in all kinds of ways, from the workaholic who works that, uh, overworks for the sake of money to the overspender to the person who spends a a great time worrying about money. All of those things, constantly stressing about it. All these ways are ways to be unrighteously enslaved to wealth. You can be a big spender, you can be a big saver, and both can be an idol. Both of those things can be pathways to be enslaved to money. And Jesus is addressing that for all of us today, saying, watch out. I must be first love in your life. So you don't work for your money, Jesus says. Make your money work for you, but ultimately for others in need, for the kingdom and the church and in the world. The Bidi Anabwile, say that name three times fast, um, said this, a quote that's coming up on the screen. We're not good stewards if we cannot see beyond earthly dwellings and possessions to the home that's coming in the kingdom. So we must ask ourselves questions. Do we recognize that all we have belongs to God? He's the owner. We're merely the stewards, the caretaker. Do we use what we have in a way that pleases God or cheats God? Are we storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven or are we trusting the world's riches that will surely fail? Now, of course, Jesus isn't saying in this passage, you can buy your way into heaven. He's not saying that. Even though there is some sense where he says, put your money to work for you in a spiritual sense. He's not saying, buy your way into heaven, but he's saying, I want your heart and loves, and if I get those, I will direct your money too. It's challenging, isn't it? We hold one thing here, the physical, tangible, and we categorize or put a wall spiritual here. And Jesus is breaking down that watertight wall today. Here's a second one for us today, and it relates to the first and also to the third we're going to look at. We're called also to steward our faith and heart well in this passage. As we move kind of from the parable now into this verses 10 to 17, we get to the heart of the matter kind of, which is our own hearts and the way we deal with our stuff and our things is really not just a matter of skill or financial smarts or great financial planning. All those things are good and well and important, but ultimately what it is, as Jesus gets to in verses 10 to 17, it's a matter of our character. It's a matter of our our faith or our heart even. Look at verse 13 with me. Right to the heart of the matter, Jesus says, no servant can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. And the verses above, Jesus basically says to the people listening, if we can't handle our earthly money for God's sake, or the little things, or someone else's wealth, those couple verses say there, what makes us think that God will give us true riches, heavenly riches? And verse 12, if you haven't been faithful as a steward here, you have no reason to think that God will give you what is to come. Jesus is giving some really hard words. That's why the Pharisees probably respond in in ridicule and laughter. This is where the rubber meets the road of discipleship, and Jesus brings it, zeroes it down like a laser beam right into real life and the places we live and work and spend. It's very challenging. And what he's getting at in this verse here, in verse 13, is getting to the heart of idolatry and who or what you serve. Now, um, the Bible doesn't say money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all evil. The serving of it, the giving it the place of prominence in your life 
And that's really what an idol is. An idol is anything more important that you make more important in your life than God. How do you know what an idol is in your life then? And here's a question we bring up from time to time. How do you respond when it is threatened? How do you respond when that thing is threatened? That could be anything, really. Your reputation, your sense of intelligence, your finances, your looks. Uh, anything could be an idol. Your quiet time, your time alone with family, your um, vacation time, your free time, your hobbies, any of those things. How do you respond when that thing gets threatened? Well, when your money's threatened, what do the Pharisees do? They laughed at Jesus because their idol was being threatened. They didn't respond in a biblical, loving, godly, holy way. They laughed at Jesus. They have to dismiss him because his words were ringing true and they were biting and they were stinging and he was tearing down the watertight divide between the spiritual and the physical, the sacred and the secular, and he was bringing them all together. And their excuse was to laugh at Jesus and say, well, you know, God knows my heart. He knows my heart. But Jesus goes right to the point. That's the problem. Our hearts, they fool us. Our hearts can deceive us. We love other things at times more than God. John Calvin, the great reformer, called our hearts a factory of idols. (laughs) It's a factory of idols ever producing more and more things that vie for our love with God. And verse 15b says, there are some things actually. Take a look at it with me there. Verse 15. For what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying there are some things in your life that you call loving or that you love or that we love that in the eyes of God are actually an abomination. We can fool ourselves that much, Jesus says something we cherish, something we value, something we hold on to that Jesus looks at and says, that doesn't please me, and uses that strong word abomination even. Just because we put the label of love on it, or even if our culture puts the label of legal on something, that doesn't mean God sees it the way we see it. That's what that verse is saying there. Just because we see it one way, even as Christians, doesn't mean that's the way God sees it. And that's the heart of stewardship. Seeking to have the eyes of God as we look around at our world and our life and what we do with the things we're called to steward. And Jesus' response is, you can't fool God with your love. God sees your heart, which on the one hand is comforting, but on the other hand, it can be concerning to say the least. You think you can act religious, Jesus is telling his Pharisees on the outside, but God sees to the depths of your soul. He sees your heart. That's why it's so important to be a good steward with your faith, with your soul, with your heart, with your relationship with Christ, whatever you want to call that part of you. Because from it springs your life. From it springs your loves. Because we're we're given so much to steward. Not just money. Let's make this really practical. What are some of those things? Even our youth today, listen, as youth, you are given the the responsibility to steward how you grow in your mind right now as a student or how you use your body as an athlete even or in other ways in life. You're called to steward things. How you live under the authority of your parents right now as some of our youth, you're called to steward that right now. So this isn't just for the adults. This is for you too. Here's some other ones. And these apply to both adults and kids, most of them. Our hearts, we're called to steward. Our church, our local body, our children, our money, we've said. Each other's reputation, Christ's reputation. Stewarding our eyes, what we look at with our eyes. Stewarding our ears, what we hear. Stewarding our tongue, what we say. Stewarding the world, the creation, our environment, the world God has given us, creation care. Stewarding our time. Stewarding the gospel. Timothy, take the good deposit that I'm handing to you. Steward it well. Pass it on to other men and women who will teach it well too. How are you stewarding these things? Stewarding your growth. How are you stewarding your own spiritual growth? Or stewarding your own discipleship? Or let's even say the discipleship of others. 
Because you're not just responsible for your own growth. We are accountable to each other. Let me say that again. How are you stewarding your own spiritual growth or stewarding your discipleship or others? It's the most important thing we do. It is the most important thing we do because if we focus on putting the love of our hearts in order and make Christ first, these other things will fall into their proper place. Wasn't there something Jesus said about that? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added to you. All these other things will have their appropriate place. Seek first the kingdom. Steward Jesus well and your heart well and your faith and soul well and these other things will line up in your life. It might take time and yes, it'll probably be painful in some ways. But are you squandering your heart and soul would be the other question. Not are you stewarding it well, but if you're not stewarding it well, are you squandering it? Or maybe faking it as the Pharisees were. That might even be worse. Take a look at your outline there. I I put next step questions a lot of times, or next step things at the bottom of the outline. You see that there are next steps? Maybe you've never even noticed that. Those are there for us just to keep going with the sermon and maybe some activities or exercises you can do throughout the week that um, apply to the sermon. Um, Our growth group questions usually do as well, but those are just for all of us too. The first one there, read it with me uh, silently, not out loud. Are there areas of your life that you trick others into thinking you are religious, like the Pharisees did, but the reality is something far different? Could you look at your life with an honest look and take those things to God? Can you take those to God in prayer? How how are you stewarding your own spiritual growth, stewarding your discipleship and others here? Do you even think in those terms? Maybe that's a good question. What are you doing to grow? Doris Robertson was a member here, attended here for six decades. (laughs) 60 years um, she'd been attending here many years before some of us were born. <laughs> 60 years. As we were planning her service with her family a couple weeks ago, uh, her family came in, in the, a couple of our deaconesses were there too in a meeting, and they said, we really want you to read something. You, you have to see this. And they said, you, you can share this with the congregation as well. They gave me permission to do that. I would never do this uh, to Doris without her family's permission, but It was the last thing she wrote in her prayer journal before she got sick and passed away. And I wanted us to see it because as we talk about this idea of growing as disciples and cultivating, stewarding our spiritual life, I was given a window into a depth of spiritual life. I didn't, you know, I knew Doris, but she said this, this was on the 24th of February. She was in the hospital, I think a week later and never out really. Precious Lord, thank you for always being with me. And she was praying Psalm 54, praying the scriptures. You see that up top there? Can you see it? Oh, good, you can. Precious Lord, thank you for always being with me. You are my solid rock, and you protect me from evil. You hold my hand, and you comfort me when trials and troubles visit me. You never, oh, you encourage me and give me strength. You are my hope and my salvation. You cover me with your hand and bring me joy. Your love is my guiding force. And then she prayed for us. Guide Pastor Jeff and give him words that bring us closer to you. Bless his family and keep them all safe. Lead Bethany. She's praying for you. And help us to be a light shining for you. She's praying for you. Encourage and strengthen them, you again, your workers there. We praise your name for all the good you have done. Pretty pretty powerful. (laughs) How quickly her prayer, yes, it's personal, yes, it's individual, yes, it's with God, but she knows how quickly she's praying for you. And us, and me as pastor, and I'll share that to be self-serving today, but thank God she was praying for me and my family for protection. And I know many of you do. I know that. That's not to, that's not to uh, shame us this morning, but just to show an example of someone who's stewarding her heart and faith well. And it doesn't just mean her own private devotional life. 
But Bethany Church, you break into her private prayer time. Because as important as our private devotional life is, it isn't actually how you grow. According to the Bible, you only really truly grow in a community through the word as we proclaim it to each other, as we pray it to each other, as we share it with each other, as we hear stories and joy and, and share these things together like bubbling up in a cauldron. You know, that's how we grow. Not on our own. And you can see it right in Doris's prayer. That's what verse six, 16 and 17 are about. We are accountable as stewards to God's standards in his word for our entire life. As Jesus says, not one dot, not one Dot of the law will pass away, Jesus says. That's shorthand for the scriptures at that time. Um, we're accountable. <laughs> we're not quite ready right now, but come fall with our growth groups, with our DNA groups, come fall, we're going to roll those out a little more um, robustly. And we're going to challenge pretty much everybody in the church because stewarding your spiritual life is that important and, and being part of others, for every person I would love, 100% would be awesome, either in a growth group or a DNA group. And we're going to do the best we can to lay it out, make it as easy as possible. We're going to make the organization and the signing up as easy as possible. But I can't sign you up. I can encourage you, and friends can encourage you, but I also can't make you feel the importance of stewarding your soul and community. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But a good steward, as we look at Jesus' words today, doesn't stand on the sidelines. Sees the value of community and leans into that. Stewarding our heart and faith, it's the second one. And then finally today, we're called to steward our relationships as well. So, what verse is it? Verse... Uh, 18, yeah. Verse 18 seems to come out of left field. And maybe you thought, well, he's just going to try to get this one out of the way quick by adding as a tag on to the end of this message so he doesn't have to talk about marriage very long. <laughs> Not the case, actually. Seems to come out of left field, but we're talking in, about stewarding things well, and then we get this verse on divorce and remarriage. So what do we make of this? What Jesus is doing is pressing the point of verses 16 and 17 that as he comes to earth, he in no way is relaxing our call to be holy, our call to be obedient, our call to follow his moral law, right? No, no, no dot of the law is going to pass away. He's pressing the point with this verse 18. At the heart of stewardship is managing things, isn't it? Money and finances, our eyes, our tongues, our relationships, as God would have us do. And so there's a connection here to how we steward the most intimate human relationship that there is, marriage, in the way God intended. Even as we talked about stewardship, I, I, I'm guessing with some of you, your mind has traveled to family obligations as we, that we all have. Stewardship makes us think and go towards those relationships that mean the most to us. And so it actually makes sense that Jesus makes the transition here when you think of the overall context of how important stewardship is, that he goes to the most important intimate of relationships. Remember, context is really important. And in light of the context, it makes sense. It makes sense that Jesus would speak against adultery as he's talking about holy obedience and stewarding to a people who thought divorce was justifiable for almost any reason. It's not just possessions, he's saying, but relationships you're called to steward as well as disciples. I was thinking of this, it made me think as I was studying this, like, where am I prone to do this? Where am I prone to not steward my relationships well? Maybe as a parent, as a, as a brother, as a son, as a father, as a husband. We've all at times told our spouses, you know, well, there's so many ways we could do this, but I'm going to get something done. I'll do that. I'll take care of it. I'll do this thing. It's going to help our family, our marriage. And I, I, there's times that I have every intention to do it. And then guess what? Drop the ball. I don't do it. Or maybe you don't do it and you let it go. And it's like, it's not stewarding the thing, the relationship, the marriage, the friendship, the relationship well. Or maybe in marriage or other relationships, we hold on to grudges. 
not extending forgiveness, the silent treatment, not being honest with our hurts because the discomfort of actually having to deal something is or more important for us to just be, you know, the peace and liked rather than actually deal with the real thing in our heart, withholding affection. All ways we can do damage to our marriages, but generally speaking, relationships as well. And Jesus is saying, if you can't steward your marriage well, but live adulterously, we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking we'll be faithful to the greater covenant with God and steward that well too. If we're disloyal to our spouse. It's a challenging passage. And it's not Jesus' intent to give us an entire teaching here on divorce and remarriage, again, due to the context. But he's calling us in the context of stewarding to be reminded to steward your marriages that shows a heart that is loyal to him first. And as I say this, though, as I say this, and Jesus brings marriage and divorce and remarriage to the foreground, I always, I love to say this. Divorce is not the unforgivable sin. Do you hear that? As important and as much as Jesus highlights this and puts marriage in this sacred space, divorce is not the unforgivable sin. And as I said, the context here, Jesus isn't giving us a full discussion on divorce and remarriage. There are other places where Jesus does give a fuller or Paul the apostle gives us a fuller Understanding, and there are what we call exception clauses. When somebody does commit adultery, that makes divorce permissible. When somebody does abandon their spouse, and I would add to that, and I do so strongly, abuse. Yeah, maybe the spouse is still under the same roof, but abuse means you've abandoned that in marriage a long time ago. And I would say that could border even into um, spiritual and emotional and verbal. I don't even think it has to get physical. I want to be clear on that. So hear that today. And at the very least, as Jesus says this, we should hold marriage high and all be responsible for helping protect and steward the relationships we have in our life, and in particular marriage and its impact on the children and the next generations, right? But it's not the unforgivable sin. And the Lord has redeemed many a second marriage, too, and provided beautiful places to birth and raise children. But he does see it as a valuable, important, and vital thing to protect. And cherish our spouses as we love Christ. So as I was going through stewardship, you know, as, you're th- as we're thinking this morning, it, it, it's challenging. Where are those areas that you're not stewarding? Maybe there's areas you're putting on a front and faking it like the Pharisees. And I kind of felt overwhelmed this week. Maybe you do this morning. And I was reminded again, and I couldn't help but find comfort and encouragement. Not an excuse to not steward well, but do you realize that Christ stewarded everything in his life that he was ever given from the Father perfectly? Isn't that a crazy thought? We follow the ultimate steward of all things in this life of stewardship and discipleship is our final point. Every single thing in his life that the son Jesus was given to steward by his father, he stewarded it perfectly. Where he put his eyes, where he put his money, how he treated his parents, how he treated his disciples, how he stewarded his own heart and soul, his loves, and then how he stewarded the mission to come and redeem us. He stewarded it all perfectly. It's incredible. Hebrews says this. Maybe the writer of Hebrews was thinking of our passage. It's the great kind of stewardship passage. The house, the master, the the imagery's here, Jesus too. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. So if you're struggling with your stewardship, you're feeling like a failure, Consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful, there it is, stewarded it, was faithful to him who appointed him, gave him the stewardship, just as Moses also is faithful in all God's house, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. As much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. 
For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. There's the master, we're the manager. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant, manager, to testify to the things that were to be spoken later, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. Jesus, the ultimate steward, perfectly did it. Not only the builder of the house, but he came to the house as a son, didn't he? And he's worthy of more glory. And in my poor stewarding, I have an ultimate steward. It doesn't excuse me from being a good steward, but in my failings, he forgives me. And in encouragement, I look to him and see how he handled it all by trusting the Father. We're walking the path that he walked. Again, we say, Jesus never asks us to do anything that he hasn't already done himself and infinitely more so. He's the ultimate steward, too. Even Moses, who stewarded so well a wandering desert community of a million grumbling people. Who wants to sign up for that? He did it well, but he, the writer says, Jesus did it even better. So hold fast today. Bring your stewardship failings even if it was a marriage, bring it to the foot of the cross. Find forgiveness, mercy, and grace to go forward stewarding better today. Let's pray. Christ, we love that you were the great steward who did it all well and right and good and perfect. There's hope in that. There's forgiveness in that. There's mercy in your passive and active obedience how you stewarded everything perfectly, the builder of the house, but also the one who came to live in it for us. So grow us in our stewardship today. Holy Spirit, would you probe the parts of our life and our hearts where we are prone to hide or cover or to not give to you as you call us to steward everything well. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Will you stand with me as we continue in song? Grace, what have you done? Murdered me on that cross Accused in absence of wrong my sin washed away in your blood Too much to make sense of it all Know that your love breaks my fall Scandal and grace You died in my place So my soul will live to be Never the hope 
just to know you. Jesus, there's no one beside you. Forever the hope in my heart. It's all because of
worship band. Maybe this morning was a tough one for you. Maybe the spirit and the scripture shine some light on a part of your life where you realize and acknowledge, I haven't been a good steward. I don't want you to carry that burden alone. Uh, once a month, our elders are up here after service to pray. Maybe there's some, you just need somebody to affirm to you today forgiveness for that area that you didn't steward well or haven't in your life. Or somebody just to pray with you for some other thing going on in your life. Don't carry burdens alone. We've been redeemed to redeem one another. We can't carry those things alone. A few of our elders will be up here afterwards. We can move the chairs, maybe even sit down up there and, and pray together. Uh, come to see them if you want somebody to pray for you today. Uh, and as we head out today, growth group, grab one of these. It's chapters one through three for this week. They're really short chapters, so that's only like six, seven pages, something like that. Those are out there, so grab one and read chapters one through three for your groups this week. And other books out there as well. Come back tonight, 7 p.m., worship night. Let's bless one another as we head out. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday. I'll see you out there.